Hey guys, Joe Miles here with Osseo Gear. This is the Mission Whitetail Podcast. We're going to be doing a deep dive into what it truly takes to kill these mature bucks. We're going to step outside the box and look at the why for gear, tactics, training, and more importantly, the mindset from over 35 years of chasing these magnificent animals all over North America. Thank you for following along and welcome to Mission Whitetail. Hey guys, welcome back to the Mission Whitetail podcast, uh, getting into the rut. It's about to be here. <laughs> As always, we're going to dive right into some stuff. Today's episode is going to be kind of a season update and viewer or listener submitted questions. we got a list of them here and we, we took as many as we could. Um, and we appreciate you guys sending them in. We got some really good questions here to go over. First, um, you know, this podcast is is really not about sponsorships and um, you know trying to monetize this or anything like that. So we we try to keep the salesy stuff out of it. Just one update is that the Osseo Gear, uh, I guess Black Friday sale is going to be starting really soon. And there's going to be some incredible discounts on there. So, guys, be looking out for that. Um, When this thing airs, I think it'll be that week or the next week, but it'll be on the website and all the social media posts. It's going to be the biggest sale of the year. So anybody that needs stuff for the rut or late season or even want to get a jump on early season for next year, it's going to be a heck of a sale. So I'm going to cut that real short. going to dive right into the podcast. Guys, we obviously appreciate your support with Osseo. Um, season update. Uh, had a good trip to Kansas. Yeah, you did. <laughs> uh, <laughs> wasn't a very long trip either. No, it was short and about got divorced. But uh, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? So, I uh, went out to Kansas with a buddy. He was working on his farm. I was working on the tracks property, which is one that I have hunted before. Just getting some final stands hung, some cameras out, and sure enough, when we actually landed. I got a nighttime pick of the tracks buck. Well, nighttime. I guess it was like 5 a.m., so it was early, early morning, coming through the funnel that um, I had planned on hunting him in. And so that was a good sign. And so I got a couple more cameras put in there. I got a stand hung for a south wind, flew back on Friday, and when we landed, I had a daylight picture of him. And I I think (laughs) – I mean, that's perfect timing, right? Yeah. You had a high-speed fall apart, too. That was pretty funny. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, what I'm do se- I do I'm now? 17 hours away. I say, go back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I slow played it with the old ball and chain. Um, I uh, thought about driving. I looked at the weather. And normally, I, what is this, the 14th or is around the 14th, 15th of October, That that's not a real ideal time to catch a nine-and-a-half-year-old buck in daylight. But he presented it. And then Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, it's going to be lows in the 20s. Yeah, it was the perfect storm. For it it sure. really was. It, it, and there was a red moon, um, mm-hmm. you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So talked to the old lady, and she gave me her blessing, which she normally does. She, she's a pretty good uh, partner in life, when, especially if you like to hunt. <laughs> she's a trooper for sure. Yeah, and so – I got on a plane at 5.30 a.m. out of Columbia with all my stuff, flew back out there. It was the Chiefs and Bills game, so there were no rental cars. So that was a hurdle. (laughs) But Seymour agreed to come and pick me up at the airport, went back to his house. He had an old beat-down Suburban he gave me, and off to the tracks I went. Um, we got a little cabin that I can stay in out there, so got in, or it's a farmhouse. Stayed in the, got everything set up in the farmhouse, Went and got on the stand, uh, had a north wind at, let's see, 4.30. Got dark at 7, or 7.15, I think was last light. <clears throat> at, I don't have my times right here, but let's just say 6.45, there was a doe out in a cut bean field that I could see from the funnel, and I heard a deer jump um, a cattle fence. I could hear the wire go ping. And so, obviously, that put me on alert. What did the wire do? It went ping. 
<laughs> you try it. That ain't natural. I, I let's, think you, let's hear yours. Ping. Yeah, yeah, way better. Yeah. Way better. I'm, but that ain't that ain't something you hear in the wild, so that'll really Yeah, that'll right, heighten, right. and it was windy. Whoa. Yeah, yeah. so that's high alert. Said. Yeah. High alert. <laughs> <laughs> Derailed. Okay. Right, keep going. So I'm looking at the doe and I can't really see back to my west very well because there's still a lot of foliage on the trees. And um, I'm looking at the doe, looking at the doe, and trying to look back to the to the west. And she finally throws her head up, and she's looking up in there. And I look, and there's the tracks buck. Um, little history on that deer: when he was four and a half, he got shot. I thought it was the neck, but I actually talked to the guy that shot him. He shot him in the butt, um, hit him in the ham. It, he was hunting. It, you know, it was just a bad luck thing for him, good luck thing for me. It was he was hunting in a severe uh, snowstorm. And it was blowing about 30 miles an hour and snowing, and, and he just pulled the shot a little bit and hit him. I think the deer was steep quartering away, and he hit him too far back. Um, the next year, obviously didn't know if the deer made it or not, and the deer did show back up. The follow, So that was him as a five-year-old. As a six-year-old, a buddy of mine hunted him the entire rut, um, never got a crack at him, never saw him in daylight. As a seven-year-old, I hunted him for the entire rut, my last picture of him was on November 2nd, and I never saw him or never got another picture of him. I was 100% convinced the deer was dead. I hunted like 14 days in a row, three days from daylight to dark, never saw a deer. Uh, it, it about drove me crazy. Last year, another guy went in there um, and kind of hunted a different end of the property, and it was really a spot like normal that you would never ever think that the deer would would come from or be bedded in but sure enough it was one of those out of the way places actually near a cattle barn if you can believe it um, and now that you look at it from a from a macro from a 30,000 foot view it makes perfect sense um, and I, I should have done a better job uh, but you know lesson learned um, the deer showed back up, and he actually daylighted last year. But again, you know, he's getting so old, you don't know if he got blasted during rifle season or if he made it through the winter. But I got that that picture of him, and then, it, you know, I won't say it's anticlimactic because my plan was to go back November 1st or October 31st and, and do my rut grind there. Mm-hmm. But the first afternoon I got there, he came be bopping up that funnel, and I shot him, and um, he ran – I guess I could tell the dramatic part of him standing there behind – yeah, he stood behind a, a big tree, and I'm watching the light fade, and I'm looking at my pins, and they're getting lighter and fading and fading and fading. He's just standing there, standing there, standing there, and the doe kind of hopped off, and he's, his big fat neck, he threw his – I never will forget it. He threw his head up, and there's just giant neck, and he took two steps forward, and, and I got anchored right on him. It's a 25-yard shot. He mule kicked, ran out into a little meadow, and uh, I watched him get wobbly legged and and go down. And I think you may have been the first person I yeah, yeah. said I just killed him. I think I was just getting into Kentucky or getting ready to head to Kentucky, and I looked at my phone and I was like, "That son of a gun!" I'm not sure that's what you said. I think there were other short yeah, four I, letter words. Yeah, I was I was letting it eat, but I was pretty dang. <laughs> I was pretty hype about it. I was. For sure. Yes. Um, just, you know, lesson learned there is is stay after it, I guess. Keep grinding. Um, and, and, and don't – we talk about it all the time. No stone left unturned. Mm-hmm. And I had definitely left a part, part of that property unturned. Um, and, and, you know, I, I guess that's the, the, the lesson is that, man, if, if you don't – if you don't check it, you're not going to know, and that can be the exact spot. It, it, and that's where he came from, wasn't yeah, yeah, it? Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. So you you were telling me the story yesterday. I meant to ask you. I just thought of this. Um, did you have to change your the way you access the property mm-hmm. at all? Brilliant. Yes. Okay. So it was a main road that he was actually crossing to mm-hmm. get on our property and come up the draw where I was hunting him. And I'm not so sure that he couldn't see everything back to the north where he was bedding 
and that's normally how you would always enter the property. Mm-hmm. So what I did is I actually j- drove that old Suburban up the road past him to the south and parked on the main road when I could get out of hearing, and I came in from the south because I had a north wind right. through, through the actual cattle pasture and had to climb two fences, but I came in from there was no way he could know that I stopped the truck and no way he could have seen um, you know, my approach. Whereas if I had gone in the normal way, I'm not so sure he couldn't have seen me, and he damn sure would have heard yeah. um, you know, me, me stop the truck, get out, close the door at 4.30 in the afternoon. Um, so, yes, that was a that, that, that good question. So that spot was pretty much bulletproof for, for him if you were parking in the same place that you had been and everybody else had been parking that's been hunting him. 100%. He, it, it just tips them off that somebody's in there. So with yeah. you changing it up on them. We'll have to do a hunt breakdown and, and draw it out on a map so you can kind of see what was going on. Um, and I can even get an aerial. I'm going to kind of zoom in on the aerial because there's another one in there. That, another funny thing is when I say there was not another buck in that area, I'm, I'm not kidding. I'm talking about a square mile. Yeah. There was not another buck. And, I mean, not another buck. And it took 10 days for another buck to come through that funnel. And it's, it's a tight funnel. I mean, and, and I've got – I had two cameras in there, and, you know, you would get anything that came through there 10 days before another buck came through. Yeah, he for sure ran the roost around there. Cool deer. Uh, you know, glad to have it. Uh, check made it and, and him not just die of old age so that that was good um yeah he was about seemed like he was about un- unkillable for a while there yeah we, we were we didn't really have high hopes after last year no that, um, that is for sure my season has been pretty anticlimactic compared to that i guess it's kind of like a normal person season <laughs> not, not a joe miles season but I went on the same cold front as you for a couple of days to Kentucky and saw probably every deer but this 10 or 11 point that I've been after since early season. I, I said I've been after. I got nighttime pictures of him. I know he's around. Um, but I named him Wide Clyde. He's like, a, how wide is it do you because think he's he is? thin? I mean, because he's narrow. That's why you called him <laughs> yeah, Wide Clyde. Yeah. How wide do you think he is? Kevin, I'm going to say he's 22 inches wide. Yeah, I was going to say. He's he's pretty dang wide, but I saw every deer. I saw he's eight. five by five, right? Yeah, he might have one extra on his He's a heck of a rider. Boy. Yeah, he's an awesome Kentucky deer. Um, plenty big for me. But um, I saw eight million does, small bucks, everything but him. I know he's around, but I guess we just need to wait till the, the rut really breaks off and i need to get back in that because i was in an awesome funnel and the does were doing exactly what i wanted him to do he just needed to be behind one and it was it was one of those deals where like around here i usually get a glimpse of something or identify what it is before i really grab my bow because then you're just like stranded sometimes with a bunch of does around you Every time I heard a deer walking, I was like, it's him. I pulled, <laughs> I pulled my bow off. Yep. And I was like, all right, there's a big doe. He's behind her. Shit, another doe. <laughs> <laughs> it was a doe parade. Yeah, so um, we'll see if I can make it back up there. I'm, it might have to be after rifle season, though, so that kind of sucks. I don't have high hopes with the – we had some trespassing problems again um, when I got back up there. There was some – as soon as I got there, I went to scout, look for some scrapes on the field edges, and there were like four guys and a dog mm. walking around on the back of the property. So mm. uh, hurdles, man, hurdles. Yeah, but um, other than that, got the eight point that's playing no show lately. That's here local, and then I got kind of got tired of nothing good on my little private spot, so I started stomping around on some big tracks of public and i got a nice one Mm -hmm. on a scrape at night but um i might dive back in there this weekend and try to hone in on them a little bit chase got your buck mounted he looks beautiful oh yeah chase courtney out of florence he sent me some pictures of my buck my velvet first velvet buck and that thing 
is freaking awesome. The, the detail that he puts into their faces, I mean, those veins popping, it, it's... It, I, I was blown away. I was like, holy shit, that's my deer. <laughs> when he said it looks good. Picture. I was like, wow. I am a little bit, um, I need to, I guess, talk to him. Yeah. I'm trying to figure out why the mule deer. Yeah, get, I, get I got, first I got and, the, yes. the privilege there. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, but, well, uh, I ain't mad at you for it, Chase. <laughs> yeah, uh, but that is something, guys. I, I, I mean, everybody's got their guy. Everybody's got their taxidermist. Um, but but if, if you kill a special deer, um, you know, like everything else, ch- that, that has real good value, um, that's real good quality, it's not cheap. Chase is certainly not the least, most least expensive taxidermist. Um, he ain't the most expensive either. No, no, he's not. But but he does as good a work on a white-tailed deer and ducks mm-hmm. as I have ever seen from anybody. Yeah, he's he's real. Is it meticulous? I guess about he taking pays his time to and detail. Good. Gosh. Um, he he's come over a handful of times and watched me tune his bow and. I mean, we had to get it down to the freaking 64th, 32nd on the on everything, and or he wasn't happy, which that's how I am too. So for him to take the time with our deer and uh, do such a good job, that's freaking that's awesome. Yeah, so I, we're we're excited to get those back. Um, and and next, I guess we can hit you know kind of next. I guess you're gonna try and get back to Kentucky over a weekend or something and try mm-hmm. and kill that buck. Um, I'm headed to Ohio Sunday to hunt the rut up there, um, and just going to shoot c- another big one in a couple of days. Nah, I don't know about that, nah, dog. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm excited. I mean, it, you know, my, my plans got a, a little bit changed, and I'm absolutely fine by that. But, <laughs> yeah. but I had planned on hunting Kansas the whole rut, and now going to Ohio, um, switching up there, hunting a buddy's lease, and or two 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 guys really have um invited me up to hunt so i'm gonna go up there and hunt some property up there and see what happens um yeah all right let's dive into these uh listener questions and what i thought we would do is i will read the first one and answer it and then you answer it and then you read the second one and answer it so that way we're not running off of i got you that sound good Mm -hmm. All right, the first one, um, and guys, if you submitted a question and we didn't get to it, very sorry about that. Obviously, we have a limited amount of time here, but we'll do another one of these. So if you've got questions, submit them, and we'll we'll get them on as, as quick as we can. And I, d- didn't Lauren say that we were going to draw like for a T-shirt or something or a hat? or I think, I think we are giving something away um, out of these. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven questions. So – one, you, you got a pretty dadgum good chance of winning whatever yeah. it is she's giving away. Yeah. All right. Sorry. Okay, the first question, J.J. Ducart is a buddy of ours that owns the Deer Society out of Minnesota. Um, his question is, if you only had one tag this fall, which state would you choose to hunt for a chance at the highest scoring buck? Break down your reasoning with some good stories or background. Thanks. Mm. That's a good one right off the road. Yeah, that's JJ's really trying he's trying to trip us up. Uh-huh. He's JJ. trying to get in on our spots, JJ. Yeah. So I'm gonna be <laughs> I'm gonna be super vague on my yeah. answer. No, I so to me it actually wouldn't be a state. For me, it would be Alberta. Um if you said, Okay, you gotta pick one place to hunt this year to kill the highest scoring deer you possibly can kill. Um, it would be Alberta. The reason for that is because they have monsters up there. Mm-hmm. All right, that's that's the first reason. There's not a ton of pressure, um, and the season starts the first of September, so you got to crack at them at early season, and then their rut is crazy predictable. You know, like November first, it's freaking going, and you know, all the way up to Thanksgiving, it, it is it is every year boom, boom, boom. It's because their weather gets so right and so cold. Um, he he wants stories and background. Um, the the problem I have with Alberta, it, there's a couple problems with it. I guess you, you can't lease ground up there. Mm-hmm. It's tough to buy ground up there. You have to get permission, and it's really hard to find a guy that is super serious like we are down here 
about bow hunting whitetail. They they have kind of a little bit different of a of a tradition up there. And 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 granted, it's just because I haven't stumbled across the right guy. So anybody in Alberta listen to this, I'm not banging on Albertians and how y'all hunt. But th- th- there's a lot of driving around, spot and stalk type stuff. And I killed that mule deer up there. So I mean, that's a, definitely a good way to do it. But and there is some trail camera running, um, but you know, you, you look at a Seymour that's an outfitter, if you will, in Kansas. Just, just he, he knows all of his properties like the back of his hand. Um, knows what's in there. Runs hundreds of trail cameras, and it, it's just not. I, I got to work harder up there, getting hooked up with the right landowner or, or the right guy mm-hmm. that, that takes it super serious. But if I can get that nut cracked, and that is my plan, because I've been up there seven or eight times, and, and we killed that big velvet buck. Kevin yeah. filmed me shoot a big velvet 160-inch eight-point up there. And, um, you know, I've, I've seen some other giants up there, and I know they're there. It's just a matter of figuring it out. It is a long way from home, and it's obviously another country, so it has some definite hurdles. But um, that's my long-winded answer. It would be Alberta, and, and, and I just think that's a, a great place that doesn't get a ton of pressure. Yeah, Kev. Um, mine would probably be in my position right now. It'd be Ohio. Mm-hmm. Um, there's monster deer up there. Um, you can from here we can get to a a good spot in southern Ohio in six and a half, seven and a half hours. Um, and I have some. I have family that lives in northeastern Ohio, so um, I have a few permission spots up there that I could hunt and um, there's some really good deer up there so um, as far as cost effective and not being too terribly far from home especially being able to drive with all your stuff um, I like Ohio and I've I lived there since I was 14 so I have a lot I've had a lot of run-ins with good deer um, back in the day I wish I knew what I know now, when I was freaking 12 to 14, I'd have a lot better deer on the wall. But, um, but yeah, Ohio, or there's some good spots in western Kentucky, too. Um, that There's a couple deer I got on camera out there that um, flipped my switch a little bit. So, <laughs> yep. make my bird twitch. <laughs> <laughs> the righteous gym stuff. Yeah. Uh, what a great one. Okay, next is uh, Reese Ely. E- Witherspoon? Yeah, Reese without her spoon. Reese Ely, E A L Y. Is that how you say it? Ely? My dyslexia is uh, kicking. Oh, no, I need, I okay. need glasses. Reese's question, and Kevin, you go first on this one. When you get a trail camera picture of a deer early in the morning, mm-hmm. right before dark, well, I guess he means right before daylight, uh-huh. does that mean you are close to their bed? I think, um, and I don't know as much as you do, but I feel like it's kind of situational to the time of year. Ah, You stole my answer. Um, (laughs) Like this time of year, uh, I got that, I got that one I showed you on, on the public land. It was like 630 on that scrape right before daylight. And I'm like, Joe, I didn't pull up the aerial or nothing. We didn't get into it, but, and I haven't even gotten into it yet, but I'm like, where is this? sucker going right now um but two more two nighttime pictures in a row i only got one picture of him um but he's heading the same direction every time so um but i think early season yeah you're close to his bed this time of year um i think it could it depends on the state and and if it's rut or what but i f- i feel like this time of year for anywhere uh it could be a dang crap shoot in my opinion i'm my plan and i was going to run this by you too later is to kind of do a little more scouting in that general area now and uh just throw out a few more cameras or see if i can find like a observation place to sit one uh one morning or afternoon Sounds good. Um, I, I, I say if you just throw the rut out of it, regardless of what state you're in, just throw the rut out of the equation because during the rut, you can get a picture of him at 5 a.m. 
and at 2 p.m., you'll get a daylight picture of him half a mile away. So throw that out the window, Reese. And, yes, if it's early season, late season, um, even right up until the rut, if you get a right at daylight morning picture of him, you are darn cl- – especially if he's a super mature buck, mm-hmm. you are real close to his bedroom. Um, w- one, one thing that you touched on earlier, and this is completely off topic, and you and I were talking about this in the office the other day, you know, we, we had the legend on last week, mm-hmm. um, Bobby Worthington. And, you know, you and I have – we've scouted together, we've hunted together, um, and we're always looking for funnels and pinch points. But, but having Bobby on really um, reiterated – that's a big word for me to say. Yeah, I can't spell too. it. That was wild. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> My face is starting to hurt. <laughs> Don't say that again. Re- reiterated. He reiterated that – um, the, the the importance of super tight funnels, especially mm-hmm. during the during the rut, um, and and you know that's kind of my plan when I get up to Ohio. I don't know exactly what I'm getting into. I've seen some aerials, but that's my plan is to is to get super tight rut. And I think that's what got you in, in, really in the game. Yeah. What, and, and sorry to get off, so, but I think that's important. Um, is to guys anything you can read. He's got some books out. Um, he's got other podcasts out, funnel, 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 and, and tight funnels. Yeah, and I, I may have lied a little bit. I forgot that I did get a glimpse of a shooter. I wasn't for sure if it was old Clyde or not, but I definitely would have shot him. But I was, I had, we literally did Bobby's podcast, and I left the next morning or the day after, and that was in the back of my mind the whole time, and I worked focused on funnels didn't worry as much about um you know sign as much I, but i found sign in a funnel so um that ended up panning out pretty well i didn't get a shot at them but um i got a way better idea what's going on now let's reset this camera all right next question uh thoughts opinions beliefs in no man's land i get to go first on this one I'm assuming he's talking about the high area of shooting a deer in no man's land. You know, that, that's been said where, where people said you got under the spine um, but over the lungs. And if you look at a deer's uh, anatomy, another really big word, mm-hmm. um, you will see that the lungs go all the way to the spine. So if you shoot under the spine, you're going to get lung. Uh, and, and, and I say that kind of anecdotally um, off of what I've seen. I think the quality deer management or somebody put out like a, a skeleton of a deer and another guy I saw was actually blowing into his windpipe. Remember I showed mm-hmm. you that and it yeah. inflated the lungs and they go all the way up to the spine. Now my question would be if you shot and his lungs were empty, could, could they be down below the spine? Maybe so. I don't know that to be science. But I think I think what happens is guys are shooting right above the spine in the back straps, and they're yeah. calling that no man's land. I think if you get below the spine, you, you, you've got a really, really good chance of hitting lung. So I think there is no man's land, but it just happens to be above the spine through, through, the, through the back straps, and that deer is going to be healthy. Yeah, I was gonna say the same exact thing. I don't, I don't think uh, we have the same exact answers for that. So yeah, that that one was kind of not not a much of an opinion. It just kind of is the anatomy of the deer. All right, this is a long one. And uh, <laughs> what? Th- oh, this um, I'm, I need to say who said that. Bynum Kelly is the one that said that about the no man's land. Um, This comes from J.B. Clark 16. I guess that's his Instagram handle. Uh, The question is, I've been passionate about outdoors and hunting my entire life in South Carolina and other states and recently picked up bow hunting and have quickly become addicted to it. In the past, I've always been the guys that hunted from various stands on edges of ag fields or on the family farm and was if he comes he comes if he doesn't oh well now that i'm bow hunting i've been diving into technical tactics driven driven side of the driven side and have been trying to learn as much as i can listening to podcasts watching youtube on quite a few podcasts i've listened to 
uh, featuring legends of the bow hunting community. Everyone has a common theme. They don't hunt mornings in October. Why is that? Multiple guys re- reiterate. Oh. Reiterate. Now I know how to spell it. Reiterate <laughs> this, but never give a why. Most of the time, they give a hard date of when they all start hunting October mornings. Let's say the 20th or later. This may be a simple answer I'm overlooking, but I look forward to hopefully hearing the why. Love the podcast. Look forward to bow shop y'all have at the beginning of the year. That's cool. So he wants to get his bow worked on. Oh, bow shop. Yeah. That one part sounded like my old lady about uh, if he can't, something, if he doesn't, whatever. Oh, boy. All right, I'm about to put R-rated on this. <laughs> we'll God, God. Holy moly. That's why I was <laughs> laughing. Golly. Oh, man. Oh, Sorry about that, fellas. Yeah. Um <laughs> Is it your turn or mine, you pervert? It's my turn. <laughs> oh, <go. laughs> Call me Kitty Cat. <laughs> Call me Kitty Cat. Some old lady made you touch her cans. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Those are nice. <laughs> pervert. All right. Um, I think the guys say not to hunt. Well, they say not to hunt mornings in October is because the deer... You're mostly hunting food in October, and the deer are usually still on the food in the morning when you're trying to walk into the stand, um, especially if you have to walk through a field or something. Um, you're usually doing more harm than good, where if you just go in there in the afternoon and set up and get between them and the food, um, you know exactly where they're at because if you know where they're bedded or you have an idea, and um, you don't have to worry about blowing them out of there because they're bedded down and uh, if you sneak right in there, you can get a crack at them. Um, but I think that's all has to do with your setup too, because sp- at least down here, our 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 rut starts kind of early. It seems like, or the pre rut, and we can get away with a good bit of um, at least mid to late October uh, morning hunting. Yep. So, but in other places. Um, like some of some of the spots in in Kentucky I've hunted, I I won't uh, I won't mess with it because I know I'm I'm blowing a lot of stuff out of the country. Walking through those fields, there's really really wide open fields out there, bean fields. Yep. So and and part of the Mission Whitetail podcast is the why in everything. Yeah. Right? Everything that we do, we do ask that question. So, Mr. Clark, uh, we appreciate that. Um, so, so why don't guys hunt October mornings? Um, okay, so early season, if you've got an opener like Kentucky, Alberta, Saskatchewan, um, Montana, South Carolina, whatever, they're on velvet, strict feeding patterns. You get in there in the afternoons, and you can, you can hunt them uh, going to food. They're normally bedded close to food, so that's an afternoon only because – there are exceptions to every rule here, guys. So, so there's guys that have killed monsters, I'm sure, September 2nd in the mornings. Yeah. But, but we're talking about generally. Um, so early season, afternoons only. And then what happens is they shed their velvet, the acorns start falling, crops start coming out of the fields, they get into their fall range, and those bigger mature bucks – for the most part, I, I just mm-hmm. killed a deer October 14th. It was nine and a half years old. I didn't kill him in the mornings. I killed him in the afternoon, but he did daylight in the morning. So I mm-hmm. could have, I was planning on hunting in the morning in October 15th, which I don't normally ever do. But it was a cold front. It was uh, yeah, exactly right. So the reason, the, the why that guys aren't hunting October mornings is exactly what Kevin said is the deer are feeding during the night still, and you're going in and potentially blowing up an area and if you just wait a couple of weeks to start hunting mornings when they're staying out of their beds yep you know a lot of times they're already back to bed in october and and you go through there and and you're wasting time and just sending up your spots if you just wait a little bit to start hunting mornings when they're actually out cruising and they're not getting back to bed before it gets daylight you have a much more opportunity. So you're trying to stack the odds in your favor. And if you're going in and out in the mornings in October when they're already back to bed or they're, they're, they're still out 
I don't I don't know that still out feeding is the right thing, but if you're if you're going in there and they're already back to bed in October, you you are going to really put too much human intrusion into your area. Whereas if you just wait a little bit, um, now now we talked about this with the Deer Society the other day opportunities of when you would hunt mornings in early October would be when your trail cameras tell you to. Yep. I've got one that's daylighting through a funnel in the mornings, and I've got bulletproof access to get in and out so I can get in there and I'm not going to disturb any bed whatsoever. I can get out. That would be an opportunity to hunt in the mornings in October. Also, a severe cold front like what was coming, you know, something that's 15, 20 degrees different. They're feeling frisky. You know, you are getting close to that pre-rut time. That might be an opportunity to do it. But but why, my question would be, why would you do it? If, if, you, yeah. don't have, if you don't have intel that there's one moving in daylight then, and, and you don't have a super crazy cold front, why would you do it when you know in two weeks the mornings are going to be awesome? So, so that's, I hope that answers your question. Um, but that, that's why a lot of guys don't hunt October mornings. Deer are already back to bed. Um, you're going you're gonna to bump them, tear up your spot, and you're just two weeks away from it getting really good. Mm-hmm. And, and that's Midwest, South Carolina. Our rut's going. I hunt mornings October 5th. I'll, I'll do a mm-hmm. morning hunt in a funnel because our rut's already going here in South Carolina. Right. So it's situational and where you are. Robert in Illinois. Joe, after listening to your podcast with Ben Rising – I watched the video of scissors. Guys, check that out. It's a giant. Typically shoots at like 10 steps. It's freaking awesome. Um, can you talk about the kill shot placement? Obviously, it was effective, and Ben knows what he's doing. What is the target in that situation? I was stunned to see a head-on bow shot being so effective. Okay, Robert, yep, that is a very um, – that is a very fine line there um, about w- what happened. The, the deer actually wasn't straight on. It had a little bit of a quartering to him, and there is a sweet spot there. Um, we don't encourage uh, quartering two shots at all. We want quartering away or a complete broadside. Mm-hmm. Actually, th- I could have shot the, the tracks buck quartering two a little bit right when he showed up, and I waited. Yeah. Um, it just not it's not high percentage Mm-mm. but when ben had that deer at 10 steps slightly quartering two and there is a spot between his brisket and his shoulder blade that, that's not very wide but if you put the arrow in that spot it is going all the way through the pump station and yeah. killing him as you saw on that video dead 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 so again not encouraging guys to take a frontal or quartering two shot. Um, I'm not getting into heavy airs and fixed blade broadheads because I'm blue in the face talking about that. Yeah, I'm not encouraging no matter what you're shooting, taking quartering two shots. They're not high percentage shots. But in a situation like Ben's, I would have absolutely taken that shot because it presented itself and it was so close. It would have just about been impossible to screw that up. Yeah. So if you again, you can look at the skeletal, you know, Google a deer's anatomy and look at the skeletal structure. And between the shoulder blade and the brisket is a sweet spot, right, right in there. You can tuck an arrow and it will kill them deader than a hammer. Yeah, I think it's all. Um distance dependent like 15 yards and in i would i would take that one and and much past that i'm not doing it because it's like you said it's such a fine line there's not much room for arrow arrow but or arrow but um but he was right on top of him and he had a mate he was drawn back oh, yeah, yeah, right. and that deer had a mate you could tell his eyes freaking lit up they got huge and he's like oh man and Either he shot him, or he probably would have never seen him again. Yeah, so, and, and it was a you know a kill shot. Um, yeah, you know for for sure. Yeah, he was right on top of him, so um, he he did what he had to do, and it, it worked out for sure. Yeah, I would I would have did the same thing. Died in ten seconds. Um, Robert, we appreciate it. He follows up with saying, "Love what you guys are doing and your no nonsense style." So thank Robert, you, Robert. We appreciate that. All right. Um, Sergeant First Class Thies Peter. Sergeant First Class, thank you, ma'am, for your service, first off. And here is the question. Kevin, are you ready? 
Yeah. I am very fortunate that I have private family owned ground to hunt. We talk a lot about management of deer. How do you manage the people who also hunt with you? I have a certain goal I want to achieve when it comes to the type of deer I want to shoot. I know I'm a lot more fanatic when it comes to access, wind direction, not going into places at certain time, and everything that goes along with that. I can't force anyone to hunt that way. Everyone is different in what stage of the hunting they are. They are. How do I manage my own expectations along with all the others that I hunt with? Thank you for your time. Jeez. That's a pretty tough one. You may go first. Well, I was going to say, I mean, in all the kind of private land instances that I've been a part of with other people hunting, you really can't. It seems like there's no change in people's mind. They, they're they pretty much set in their ways. Um, you can try to kind of persuade them to do things a certain way, but... I, what I've ended up doing a lot of times is throwing, you know, caution to the wind or whatever and just using those people almost like hunting public land and using them as funnels or using the, the deer to kind of, or them to kind of funnel the deer to you because those are usually the type of people that are hunting wrong winds and accessing wrong and all that. and but they'll push the deer to certain areas um, and hopefully they'll still be on the property when they push them to those areas but just hunt those areas where they're not hunting they usually have one or two stands they hunt regardless and you can hunt those fringes and capitalize off of that yep that, 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 that's a very good point um, Sergeant Peter I hate to be blunt but I'd find my own place that too I can't, I mean, you can work on this until you're blue in the face and it's not going to matter. I would rather have two acres that I hunt all to myself than 2,000. With and, and I've got a hunt club and I love the guys that are members of the hunt club and I'm very lucky that it's large and I've got some out-of-the-way places that nobody hunts and I can do exactly what you said. Um, it is They create... Um, enough human intrusion that it literally forces the deer a different way so if you are going to stay on that that farm and hunt um, you know I I would kind of plot where they are what they're doing do the opposite of what they're doing um, and hope for the best I don't think you're going to be able to change people's minds because you know a a lot of guys take it as a hobby and 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 they don't understand they, they really no. don't understand. You know, they're going out there. If they see a buck, they see a buck. If they see a doe, they see a doe. They shoot it, and they're out there to have a good time. And they, they don't want to catch a bunch of flack because they didn't look at the wind or the barometer or the moon guide or whatever it may be bef- before the hunt, or, or they you know weren't taking scent-free showers or whatever, it, access, all of that. You know, they, they just aren't as serious about it, and, and that's fine. We, we need all the hunters we can get. Um, but my advice would be, Find your own 50 acres somewhere close to there. Hunt with them socially because they're your family. But if you want to get real serious about killing big, mature bucks, you got to go find your own spot. Yeah. All right. Let's see here. Steve. Howdy, Steve. Steve Madden. (laughs) Um, Overload of questions incoming. Okay, this is going to be some rapid-fire stuff. What's the largest whitetail you've harvested – What's been the hardest hunt for a whitetail you've had and why? As hunters, we all like to see those cold fronts and weather fronts coming in. Do you have a favorite time to hunt before, during, or after these weather fronts? Do you have any plans for an Osseo base layer, full head cover, like a baklava? I can't ever say that right. Can you say that? (laughs) Baklava. 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 That's an Italian dessert. (laughs) <laughs> no, no, Greek. I, I got my ethnicity wrong. It's a Greek dessert. <laughs> Do you have any plans for a bakalad, bakavla <laughs> style hat? Steve, sorry. Um, thank you. Okay. <laughs> so, base layers, yes, I'm actually testing them now. We'll have a light and mid um, merino base layer ready to go next year. They're in the office right now. I'm taking them to Ohio. So I'll be hunting uh, with those this rut in this winter 
to make sure everything's good to go. So, yes, we do have base layers coming. Um, the, the full head hat, uh, that, that is possible. We've got a neck gaiter and a beanie now, uh, which covers 90% of your head. Um, so I, I don't necessarily know if we'll be coming out with one of those, but it could happen down the road. Uh, the biggest, largest whitetail that I have ever killed, um, 186, and he you might can see him. He's right back there. His name was Comover. Kevin actually named him. <laughs> um, I've killed three in the 180s. Uh, what's okay? The hardest hunt I talked about that at the beginning. Yeah, that would have been for uh, the tracks buck. He he ended up scoring one eighty two, so he's low one eighties. He was probably one ninety the year before, but he had he had he had a little bit short beams, and he had broke or not broken off. He just didn't regrow some of the trash he had. If he had if he had had the trash he had had the year before, he would have been in the nineties for sure. Um, and and so yeah, that was my hardest hunt as far as weather. I personally. If you had to tell me, if you had to say the best time to kill a big deer that you knew about in the Midwest, I, I think you have to pigeonhole it that much. Mm-hmm. I would say the last <clears throat> three or four days of October to the first four or five days of November with a high-pressure cold front, like 10 degrees to 15 degrees colder than normal with an overhead moon. That would be the ideal, and, and I, I really like to f- hunt on the front end of mm-hmm. those. I, I mean, obviously, they're, it's great throughout that cold front because they want to get up and move when it feels good to them like that, but I, <clears throat> I think right when that cold front starts is a, is a really good time, but, but th- that would be the beginning of that cold front as soon as it starts to drop, um, high-pressure system, overhead moon, last few days of October, first few days of november yeah okay yeah um you answered the the question exactly what i would say for the the weather and all that for killing a big deer um my biggest is actually from south carolina he scored 149 and that was my hardest hunt too and it wasn't really hard like physically or nothing but but mentally the yeah yeah um I actually missed him three years prior when he was like four and a half. Um, shot over his back at about 40 yards and ended up connecting with him three years later. Um, so I was real fortunate for that. But that was that was definitely the uh, the deer that made me lose a lot of sleep. It, it, interrupting you just for a minute so guys have this in perspective. When you say a 149 in the state of South Carolina – that's like a 220 <laughs> so yeah. and especially one with that much age that's survived this long in south carolina so yeah he we um my uncle does some taxidermy on the side and i had him do that one for me and i had him pull the jaw for me and that thing barely had a tooth in his head so he was ancient he was at least seven and a half or eight and a half i would think all right thank you steve moving on uh martin what are your top three must-have pieces of gear for any style of whitetail hunting i'm gonna assume that he is talking about clothing um or would you i tell you what i'll answer clothing you answer okay. hard, hard gear okay i mean obviously a bow broadheads whatever but from from a clothing perspective i always want to have a vest a windproof vest i always want to have some type of piece with me whether it's hotter than hades or late season freezing cold with a hood and a face mask always want to have a hood always want to have a vest that's windproof i like the hood for the camouflage and because it keeps my head warm um and then i'll actually do a two here um i always have rain gear always have at least a rain jacket Mm -hmm. but um obviously with our packable rain gear i have the pack i mean the pants and the because they pack down so small in the bottom of my pack right um and then also a really good well laid out pack so a really good bow hunting pack that opens correctly when it's hooked up to the tree rain gear a windproof vest obviously i'm not going to have a windproof vest in august but right for the majority of the season, I've always got a vest and then 
some type of a hoodie or hood with a face mask. So I've always got that. All right, hard goods, what would you go with? So obviously my bow, and I'm not going to say I'm going to need – I'm assuming that you'll, if you have your bow, you have your release, release and arrows and broadheads and all that. So I'm going to say my bow. Um, I'm going to throw the stand hunting out the window because I guess that's not a necessity. You could shoot them from the ground. Um, so a good range finder. Um, I like a at least a four power, and you can actually use that as like a monocular too with that four power that can kind of do you pretty good for um, identifying if um, it's the buck you've been after or a shooter or whatnot. Um, and then, let's see, it's kind of a gear. It, it, I guess it'd be kind of getting into clothing again, but a good pair of, um, like, good pair of hiking boots. Mm-hmm. Um, I like the, like we talked about before, I like those Danner pronghorns. Um, they're really comfortable. They held up really well. And I've got a lot of miles on them, and so um, that would be my three go-to pieces there. Ten four. All right, Jimmy, what's the minimum amount of time required to have a chance to take down a big buck? I work forty hours a week and really only have the weekends available. Is there any hope? Love the podcast. About an hour and a half, if you Joe. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he gets out of the truck. And gets the arrow in you hour and a half. <laughs> Go ahead, Kevo. I don't know what what did we always say when we'd be on the the rut grind? It's every 15, 15, 15 solid okay, sits. That's, that's thirty sits. Yeah. yeah, so fifteen solid days, thirty sits. Um, you should be due for one, unless you're me. You just keep chasing your tail. <laughs> that's all. That's I can. not true. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um. So Jimmy, here here's the deal, bud. Um, it it takes a lot of work, but you actually don't have to spend a lot of time yeah. in the stand. That's what we're getting into I, now, I big mean, time. High percentage sits. So you work. I get it. Forty hours a week. A lot of guys do that. Um, you know, I would I would hate to know how much since we started ICO last three years. How many what? the number of hours that I actually work with ICO a week. I mean, I start at 4.30 in the morning, and I go until 9.30 at night. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's whether I'm hunting, not hunting. I mean, so, so you, you've you got to make the time. It takes what it takes. you got to make the time. you got to sacrifice. you got to be disciplined. But, man, you can take two hours and go move trail cameras. You can go in the middle of the night when it's raining um, when your family's asleep, get up at 3 a.m. And, and go move a stand. Um, you know, there's, there's lots of things you can do during the downtime that's, that's whitetail work-related that you're not having to spend actually time in the stand during daylight hours um, to, to get on a big deer. If, if you, you can spend a ton of time. Our buddy Andy May talks about this all the time. Yeah. He's a single dad. He... Um, works a 40-hour week he's a a school teacher he kills giants on public land because he spends a lot of his free time um downtime if you will scouting 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 so when he gets the opportunity to go it's a really high percentage uh shot yeah so so that would be my advice man is to is to to grind man to work hard at it think outside the box um spend your time when you can getting things prepped for the rut, getting things prepped for the early season, do all that in April, you know, March, April. Um, so, so, yes, there's absolutely hope. I wish you a lot of luck, and um, keep us posted if you get one. And on, on to that, um, I've been taking a lot of uh, stuff from Andy's book when it comes to spending more free time, even just like – virtual scout and on the looking at aerial maps um and i've even cut out you know getting the latest and greatest bow or um tree stand or and just use the stuff that i've been using that way i can afford one more trail camera or something and let those things those tools do the hunting 
for me that way like you said maximize your sits when that property or the property when the weather is perfect instead of burning it up and and setting it up um that's kind of what i've been working at and and scout more than sitting it took me a while than hunting it took me a while to wrap my head around that but that's definitely helped me a lot in in gaining confidence in my in my spots when i actually do sit um having that that extra intel really helps so jimmy hope that helps you buddy and good luck to you i I feel your pain man it's tough to it's tough to get out there and do it when you got a full-time job He's smashing giants, though. Still <laughs> smashing. Okay, moving right along. Henry, we've, we've got two more guys. Um, Henry said, I saw you were asking for a question. Mine is about trail cameras. How many cameras do you operate, and do you operate on multiple properties? Go ahead, Kev. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> I, don't, I don't even, I don't know. I think I have nine or ten, and I think five or six of them are text cameras. So um, I've been trying to lean. I've been looking at buying a few of the, you know, bulk packs or deals on the cheap, uh, like wild game cameras or Tascos or whatever. But then at the same time, I look at the price of gas and I go, I mean, I'm actually coming out more in the green if I just put a Put the money toward a text camera so i don't have a, a whole lot of cameras but um i do use them and i do have them on multiple properties i got them from my private land little spots and i got them a couple of them on some public too so and and they they help a good bit um but yeah i think i think it's about 10. so henry I think you want to have as many trail cameras as you possibly can. Um, we've, we've talked about this with Don Higgins. We've talked about it with a, a bunch of people. Um, there, there is a, 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 some opinion out there that the text cameras can scare the deer. There is, and, and, and we've seen it, where a deer's come in to a regular camera and spooked or a text camera and spooked. Um, but, again, I think if you go back and listen to the Adam Hayes uh, episode one we did with Adam, he and I talked about uh, the risk is worth the reward, the live intel of a, of a text cam. So I have actually, I do have a couple of plot watchers um, that I'll use on 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 fields uh, to, so I can see the whole field. I do have a, a, a very few, maybe three or four of the regular old SD card, regular cameras, and I will throw those up in certain places, especially if I'm just going to let them sit for the season. Um, but I am a huge cell cam, mm-hmm. text cam. I'm, I'm, I'm running 22 of them, and, and I've got them all over everywhere. And I wish I had 100. If, if yeah. I could afford 100, I would have 100. <laughs> Um, and that cell bill, I would be divorced then, uh-huh. for sure. But yes, so Henry, as many as you, my opinion, and, and they're guys that, that are big buck killers that are going to disagree with me, but my opinion is as many cell cams as you can get and get quality ones. The ones we've tested um, are, are all quality cameras. Uh, the, the Tacticam that we tested yeah. did really good, and I've still got it running right now. Um, the Exodus, I've got it running on a scrape in Kansas right now, and it's getting pounded every night. And then I've got 20 uh, Spartans that are – some of them are not running right now because I'm taking them to Ohio with me. But I've got them scattered all over everywhere. So, yes, as many cameras as you can get. Yeah, it help, really helps stack the deck in your, in your favor. I mean, Live you need, intel. Yeah, you need all the help you can get with these big boys. Yep. Last question, Joel F., do you make, do you make use, uh, do you make or you, do you, oh, do you make use? Okay, got it. Do you make use of mock scrapes slash scents, and how beneficial has that been? Is it me or you? I don't know. Cool. Go ahead. Okay. Me? I'll go. Go. Um, I do it a little bit to run a camera over. And if one hits it in daylight, then I'll, with any kind of consistency, then I may sit over it. But um, I use, I'm not a big, 
And I think I kind of learned this from you, Joe. I'm not a, I'm more of like a complete surprise kind of just ambush. I don't do a whole lot of calling um, and I don't use a whole lot of sense or anything. I just, I'm mobile and I, and I try to play the wind as best I can, wind and thermal. Yeah, I, I've used more and more mock scrapes. I think this year I've put out more than I've ever put out. Um, I did put a rope scrape out. The problem I had, I couldn't get the uh, that chemical smell out yeah. of my, out of my rope scrapes. But you know, Bobby was talking to us about making you know limbs with with zip ties, and yeah. and, and I'm definitely going to try mm-hmm. some of that. You know, Don talks about the rope scrapes and letting the stuff weather for a year, and then using some lures on it. I, I will say something that I see, and it's it's human nature, um, and and. Let's hit on this for a minute. Scents. Yes, I think you can use scents in your scrapes, in your mock scrapes. You know, dump the, you know, the urine in there. I don't think it's going to hurt anything. Um, your rope scrapes, you can soak them in in uh, the, the um, orbital gland or the gland lure. <coughs> sure, you can do all of that. Um, the thing that that is is human nature that is a mistake is that guys find a scrape. They put their camera on it, and whether it be a mock scrape or a natural scrape, they put their camera on it, and voila, a big buck hits it. Mm-hmm. The first thing they want to do is go dump doe urine in it or buck urine or something like that or go paw it out deeper. <coughs> Negative. After they're already hitting At, it. He's hitting it. Leave him alone. He's already put his scent in it. He's comfortable coming in there. Go in there and kill him. Don't go in there and mess with it after he's already hit it. He's proven that he likes it and his scent is in there, so leave it be. If he shows up, now it, nothing's hitting it, sure, go freshen it up if you want to. Um, that's fine. I'm not a big scent guy. Uh, I, I, have used, I have used some, and, and the rope scrapes I probably do plan on putting some scent on. The limb scrapes I probably will not, um, just, just to test it. You know, I'm mm-hmm. constantly testing different stuff, and if I get better results out of something, we'll, we'll certainly let you know. But, um, yeah, that's that's where we are on Sense and Scrapes. So, guys, thank you so much. We, we'll, we'll hop off here. We've been a little long-winded today. Um, getting to be the rut. Y'all send us some pictures of some big ones, and good luck to you the rest of the year, and uh, we'll be back next time. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it.